Uh, so well, welcome back everyone today uh, for the session, for the last session of today, I believe. Um, so yesterday we discussed data and drug discovery, right? Uh, and how difficult it is to actually label data because the data we have uh, is very conditional. Uh, and so today what we will go through is a bit of model validation uh, in the life sciences area. So how can we build models of relevance for drug discovery? But it will actually be a well tripartite, I guess, presentation. So I will talk about the, let's say, philosophy for 20 minutes or so. And then actually uh, the young people in the group, so Morgan and Benoit, uh, will talk about their research as well, yeah? So what can we actually do? There are what's called uh, de novo designs, so generative models, language models in this case, uh, we can use for molecular design as well. So Morgan will present on that. Um, and molecules exist in 3D, so they have different conformations. And so Benoit uh, will present on how to use those types of models uh, in drug discovery as well. Um, so let's come to the validation part. So how do we actually know that something works? And that's a, that's a core question uh, from the scientific side, right? There's also a question, uh, so we started some companies, right? And if you have a platform technology, so you need to show uh, how well does that work and does it work better than what was around before, right? Platform validation, that's always uh, what people ask for. So how can we validate a model? And if you think about, for example, um, AlexNet or classifying images, right? Uh, you have some labels of your data and it's possible to label your data. That unfortunately is quite difficult in drug discovery as we learned yesterday, even water can be toxic, right? So how can you uh, label substances into class labels, right? Uh, that doesn't work as well. The data is very conditional. And that actually uh, has the result that models in drug discovery are much more difficult to validate. So those labels are either mostly only in vitro relevant, so data comes from uh, proxy model systems, right? Or they're very conditional, right? So that labeling is difficult. Um, validation is costly. So drug discovery means you take compounds into the clinic and to patients, but that is very costly from a few million, maybe for a phase one trial to uh, multiple millions for later phase two and phase three trials. So it's more difficult to do prospective validation. Um, and the most difficult thing is in chemical space, um, basically everything you do is an uh, out of distribution prediction. Chemical space is a beast. Yeah? It's much more difficult than sequence space, for example. If you have uh, proteins, you have sequence information. Then you have, for example, uh, phylogenetic trees, right? Uh, you have mutation information. You know how likely is it that one amino acid gets replaced by another amino acid. You don't have that in chemistry space at all. So you cannot make any assumptions about underlying distributions um, and changes to chemistry have a different effect in one area of chemical space than another area of chemical space. Yeah, so it's very difficult to transfer this type of information. Um, and that uh, so and that means that prospective validation of models is very difficult. Um, so retrospectively, we cannot label data. Prospectively, it's difficult to generate new data points. Um, and retrospective validation is always a bit like predicting yesterday's weather. In drug discovery, that's basically uh, no good at all. Yeah, uh, discovering a drug that was discovered in the past that doesn't work. It's very uh, little convincing for people who work in the drug discovery field. Okay, so it's in practice very difficult uh, to validate our models. And one of those core reasons is that in chemical space, uh, proper sampling is impossible. We don't know underlying uh, distributions. Um, so what, if you visualize that, so that is meant to be chemical space in this case. So every um, star or galaxy is actually one part of the chemical substructure space, if you wish. Yeah? And so usually if you train a model, so what do you have available? Uh, you have a training set where you don't really know where that lies in chemical space. You don't have an absolute coordinate system of any type. Um, then you have your uh, validation set, which, uh, well, in many cases, because of the nature uh, how data is derived actually resembles that training set in many cases. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, if you think about machine learning models for uh, clinical data, for example, you always need to make sure uh, that you have data from multiple hospitals, for example. Yeah? If you validate on the same hospital, um, then you might get better models, right? But productivity for uh, novel data sets is very low. So in chemical space, you have that type of problem as well. Um, and then you have what you optimistically might call an external test set. In many cases, it's not really external. But the problem then is, your next project, so the next type of chemistry you predict for, yeah, that might be in any other uh, area of chemical space. And uh, if you have a particular feature that changes in a structure, that feature change has a different impact depending on where you are in absolute terms in that chemical space. Okay, so it's very difficult to generalize any learnings uh, across uh, chemistry. And that means if you get a performance for your model for one area of chemical space, it tells you basically nothing about the next project. Yeah, and that's one of the problems of validating models uh, in this particular area. Um, there's two resources. So in case uh, you ever uh, train models in the on-chemical data, uh, there are two resources I would like to point out. 
So the first one is a blog I was writing a year ago, also a blog post here on uh, drugdiscovery.net slash how to lie. It's advice about how to lie uh, with machine learning models in the drug discovery area, but actually it's more about uh, uh, realistically evaluating models, right? That is the purpose. Um, the other one is a Nature Reverse Chemistry article we just published uh, two months ago. So um, there's one problem, maybe with machine learning in general, but also in the drug discovery area, uh, that quite often uh, models cannot be uh, retrained. Uh, the whole work is not reproducible, right? You don't have access to the data. Um, and so those uh, papers are meant to point out to drive the field a bit into that direction of uh, making models reproducible and actually having better uh, style uh, or better uh, practices uh, when it comes to machine learning in our area. So if you work on machine learning for chemical data, I can recommend uh, having a look at those two resources. Um, so what are common problems in our area, uh, machine learning and uh, life sciences? Um, proof of example abounds in many cases. Yeah. So a project works out, but actually drug discovery uh, or the discovered drug is the result of a thousand decisions, right? And it's very tempting then to say, uh -huh, uh, we have a drug discovered in the end, it must be due to the model. Well, that's not the only impact factor, right? And that's kind of this uh, proof by example style. So you don't have enough numbers basically uh, to validate your model. And we have quite a lot of relevant endpoints, right? We had those proxy assays. So that's uh, very cheap, easy assays. We have lots of data, but that doesn't matter in the clinic, right? Um, and so we have lots of irrelevant models uh, for uh, models for irrelevant endpoints. Um, and that is maybe the most important part. Um, if you validate a model, there's the model and there's the process. I will illustrate that on the next slide. And actually what matters is the embedding of the model into the decision-making process. Yeah? And the model by itself means nothing, but how do you actually use the model for decision-making? I will show that in the next slide. Um, then, then there are trivial successes that are quite uh, specific to chemistry. Uh, there were some uh, Nature Biotech papers even, so uh, quite good papers, uh, where some uh, in silico companies claimed they discovered a new drug by actually making a trivial change to a molecule. Yeah? And that might be you now uh, exciting that the molecule has good properties, but if you show that a medicinal chemist, that is a trivial change, right? And that's nothing what you need in a machine learning model for. It's very important to understand the domain you operate in to be credible, right? Um, yeah, and you need to have negative controls, of course, um, as well. Um, so um, what is actually, I talked about uh, model validation and process validation. So what does that mean? Uh, if you have a model, a machine learning model, uh, you usually only focus on this box here. Uh, so you have some input data, let's assume it's labeled data, solubility of drugs or something like that. Uh, you build a model, let's say a random forest, uh, and you get a prediction, uh, ideally with the confidence. Yeah? And then you're trying to optimize your loss function, so you have a, whatever, high AOC or something like that. Um, and that would be the model. Uh, but the model itself is actually meaningless in the drug discovery context. By itself, it's meaningless, but you need to think about the context. Um, and that is the context of a drug discovery project, for example. Um, there's a compound that, this is, that gets discovered to treat a particular disease. And that disease might be a lifestyle disease, let's say, yeah? uh, where, actually, uh, where actually no treatment is medically necessary. Yeah? So you feel better about certain aspects of your life. Um, and in those cases, you would actually tolerate much fewer side effects. Yeah? If you work on terminal stage three or stage four cancer, right, then you would tolerate much more side effects. And so this is the context of the project. And that context also means we work on a particular type of chemistry and that chemistry might be actually have a, might, might have a certain distribution uh, in the brain on different uh, organs. Yeah, and, and my box here, the machine learning model that predicts solubility or so, doesn't know anything about that context, right? Uh, but that context is important for how the model output gets taken and the decision is then made in the context of that project. If you predict toxicity, for example, right, the decision you make is quite different in both of those cases. And the other part that's important is what are actually the uh, follow-up essays. So I was um, heading the machine learning group at AstraZeneca for a while until a year ago or so in the safety department. And then the question is, okay, uh, you have a model that is predicting toxicity of a compound, uh, but what do you actually do as a result? If you don't know how to test afterwards, the prediction is meaningless because no one will kill the project because the model says something, right? So the follow-up essay is always the important question. What is the experiment you can do uh, as a result? Right? And if you only focus on the, uh, the central box here, so the model performance, um, you actually you improve model performance, that's great, so you have a paper or something like that, but that doesn't improve the uh, drug discovery process, right? We need to think about the input and the follow-up uh, of the model predictions that you have. Um, and that is actually a big uh, disconnect. Yeah? And quite often, if you see publications, they only focus on the central box here, uh, but in practice, uh, the input and output, not only data, but how the decision is made, uh, that's equally important as well. Yeah? 
Um, and if you validate a model, how is actually the process important for even model validation? Let's say in the chemistry context, you can have models, uh, virtual screening it's called, that select active molecules, right? But chemical space is large. So which compounds do you test? The ones which you can buy, right? And so that means you don't only validate the model, you have the model that's embedded in the process of using the model to select compounds, but the model performance is also impacted by the compounds you can buy, right? So there's this external process of model validation that has an impact on the numbers uh, the model generates in a prospective validation, right? So always uh, think about those terms, model validation and process validation. There's a context uh, of the model you use. Uh, it was quite a good uh, paper by Steve Kearsley uh, from Google actually wrote uh, exactly on that. It's on, uh, on BioArchive or one of those uh, servers. Um, and that disconnect actually, unfortunately, leads to uh, the result that many of the discoveries and papers, for example, <coughs> uh, they don't translate uh, into the practice, right? Um, so if you work uh, in a research project and you want to have impact, um, remember the uh, difference between those um, boxes, right? The goal is not only to have a high AOC or whatever measure you have, uh, but to have impact on a real world project, right? And for that, that embedding uh, is very important. Um, and there's also more, well, it's called a political aspect here, aspects here. Uh, data sharing, for example, is important, especially in pharma. Pharma is notoriously secretive uh, with data, but there are now IMI and other initiatives, right? Every data gets shared. And that's really important to have sufficient data available for benchmarking and then shared um, prospective validation as well. Um, if you make a decision, you always have to see which environment you operate in. Uh, are you actually in an uh, abundant environment or scarce environment? So do you operate in an environment where you have many starting points or few starting points? Um, and this is, uh, this is the setting here in the drug discovery context. If you're in a scarce environment, uh, you need to optimize something else than if, you uh, than if you operate in an abundant environment. So if you have few starting points, what's most important is uh, to minimize losses. So false negatives, basically. You want to minimize that. Um, so you want to have uh, compounds that could be successful. You want to lose as few as you can along the way, right? But in drug discovery, you're operating in an abundant environment. So we have many starting points, right? Uh, so what do you look for here? Well, that at least a sufficient number of compounds makes it through, right? And you need to optimize something else. And what you want to optimize is uh, to screen out as many failures as you can early on, right? So if you build a model um, and you want to have a certain um, a loss function that you want to optimize, right? Uh, that depends on the context you operate in. So basically, if you publish a paper and you optimize AOC or so, that might be relevant in a particular context or not, but it depends on which uh, environment you actually operate in, right? Uh, so it's not a uh, context independent the way you generate your model at all. Um, so how can you use machine learning models in a pharmaceutical company? Here are some examples, and you need to understand which uh, environment you operate in to build a good model. Um, you can have what's virtual screening models, find some compounds out of many possibilities uh, that could be successful. So you prioritize the top of some ranked list. And then you have a, well, you could call it the remove the rubbish model. So you deprioritize, let's say 20% of compounds where you're highly confident that they are toxic. So in this case, you uh, optimize a very different uh, loss function. Um, you can prioritize for experiments. So in this case, it's a rank ordering, uh, some Pearson correlation or so uh, that you would like to uh, have accurate. Uh, or you can have warning flags, for example, uh, models that uh, alert to some potential toxicity of molecules. Um, but you have to be careful that you don't add, end up with uh, what some people call a worrying machine. Yeah? You put in a molecule uh, and then it alerts you to 20 possible problems and you don't know what to do as a result either, right? So that's the question. So what do you do uh, with the model output? in those cases. Um, a few comments here on deep learning and what the impact would be in, um, in, in a, how it's applied in pharmaceutical companies. Three examples here. And um, so it can work well. It of course doesn't always work well, nothing does. And sometimes it's also pushed in quite a bias way in publications. And I'll give an example of that. Um, in areas where we have lots of homogeneous data, such as target prediction, right? Predicting the protein target for a small molecule, we had that yesterday. It actually performs better. Um, so you have uh, performance comparisons, right? Um, of uh, neural networks and support vector machines comes next and so on. And you see that uh, neural networks in this particular case uh, do perform uh, a little bit better. Um, on the other hand, um, in, a, in a company, of course, you need to retrain your model, right? Um, and so in practice, uh, it may or may not be worth it, a just a numerically slightly better performance. So if you look at what Bayer, so a big pharmaceutical company, for example, uses for different endpoints, uh, there you see uh, that in some cases here, you have multitask uh, neural networks here at the bottom, for example, 
and they outperform previous PLS, so partially scratch models. Uh, so in some areas, um, in particular multitask models, actually do perform better uh, in a pharma context. Uh, but some of the models you need to retrain uh, at least weekly or some even more often. Uh, and in those areas, actually random forest models are in many cases um, actually used. Yeah? But multitask uh, seems to have quite a big impact, in particular, uh, if you have physical chemical properties of compounds that are related. So larger compounds are less soluble and at the same time more lipophilic, so the correlation uh, between those properties and then multitask models really do make a difference. Um, in some areas, and that's a publication of ourselves actually, um, so that's something I published, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, uh, so that was the first uh, deep learning model for Synergy. It was published in Bioinformatics, we thought great, but a few years later I was actually reflecting on that. Um, is that actually, does that actually real world uh, impact? So in some cases, Synergy between drugs is desired, two compounds uh, actually have more activity uh, as, uh, together uh, than individually, right? And there were recently published data sets, so we trained models to predict synergy in cancer of compound combinations. Uh, so it was just about the deep neural network, so it was two layers, so it's not really deep in the, uh, in the real sense. So you encode your drug data, chemical compound data, genetic data, and you predict some synergy score. Um, and basically, they numerically, uh, that seemed to be, have been a good model. You have a true positive rate of 0.55, true negative rate of 0.95. Yeah? So it gets green out many non-synergistic uh, compound combinations. Numerically, that looks all good. But um, these are models that are based on cancer cell lines. Yeah? So it's not representative for the in vivo situation at all. Um, the question is always, if you treat yourself with a compound combination, what is actually the concentration of the compound over time in different body compartments? Yeah? And in practice, numerically, that might be a reasonable model, but in practice, the clinical impact is probably close to zero. Yeah? And so I always think about how can a model be used in the real world situation to uh, solve a problem. And uh, when I reflected on that in our own work uh, from a couple of years ago, uh, probably the impact is rather limited. So it's quite reasonably highly cited that paper, but uh, the translation into the clinic is probably really uh, quite low. Um, and there's also quite a lot of bias reporting around. So that paper here is cited, I don't know, 2000 times by now. That was one of the first papers that used deep learning on electronic health records. It's in uh, nature, I don't know, medicine or something like that. And so the abstract claims here uh, that the deep learning model uh, achieved a high OR uh, for certain uh, endpoints. Uh, so here, readmission uh, mortality and so on. Um, so here, 0.93 and 0.75 and so on. Um, and so that was the deep learning model. And then the authors also in the uh, supplementary material put in the uh, logistic regression baseline, okay? And so box down that model more or less. And you see, so you just need to compare the same colors. So red in the abstract for the deep learning models and logistic regression uh, down here. And you see the numbers are basically the same, right? Um, and so the abstract claims uh, that deep learning models outperformed everything else. Yeah? Uh, but if you look at the confidence intervals and so on, well, it's only marginal improvement, right? Um, and so it's not a lie as such, but I mean, if you compare to baseline, right, always uh, report results uh, in a realistic way. Yeah? Um, and that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's also quite a lot of psychology, of course, especially uh, when it comes to new technologies, right? Um, in the 80s, right, throughput screening was the same, yeah, believing in technology, large numbers, and so on. Um, so, and AI is probably where it is, uh, also because of human psychology, and there's many factors behind that. Here, only some. Uh, they were also listed in the drug discovery today article and um, the realism is a bit boring right uh, hype uh, brings you money and fame there's lots of fear of missing out and that's not only on the individual basis um, i mean if you're whatever 16 and you miss a party right you might have formal if you heard of that term but that also exists on the company level so if pfizer is doing something and novartis is not yeah then there's a uh, fear of missing out uh, from the uh, shareholders of novartis right and ask well shouldn't we do that as well Pfizer is doing that right uh, and so your psychology also on the company level. Everyone needs a winner. That actually leads to quite a lot of bias reporting, right? So if someone gives you 20 million to do something and you're the vice president of some company, right? And two years later, the CEO asks you, so what did you do with the money? It's unlikely that you say, well, nothing, nothing worked, right? So you always try to report on successes, huh? but that actually leads to quite biased feedback. Huh? And then it's difficult to actually compare methods, right? Yes. And so that also impacts uh, the development of new methods. The problem is, yeah, you cannot really uh, compare methods in an unbiased way. Uh, so everyone is reporting a success, right? And you don't have any uh, comparison of methods at hand. 
Um, so where's the air on the hype cycle? So that's the uh, Gartner hype cycle. Uh, many of you will be uh, familiar with. Um, it's actually only recently I looked at the axis, what they actually mean. Um, so I mean, the y axis is expectations, right? So it's nothing objective at all. Yeah, it's expectations, not any results or so. And of course, it doesn't really exist on this form. It's only perception. There's huge spread in the details. Uh, I mean, I'm really glad that Amazon Web Services or uh, GCP also are around, right? It's really fast to prototype things. Um, uh, but of course, I mean, generally, uh, many of the uh, areas we work with are probably right here uh, on that hype cycle. Uh, but some are very important, uh, very useful also in pharma, deep learning for images, for example, histopathology yeah, in the image area uh, that works very well. And that really translates to the clinic. Cellular imaging, histopathology, so organ slices and so on. Uh, you can do that very well. Um, so that is, that is, uh, is a slide from uh, February. That was a few days after the Ukraine war started. Um, and uh, in case you're thinking about uh, starting a company, right, uh, venture capital is really changing right now. Inflation rates go up, there's much less money in the market, right? Um, and you, you notice that when it comes to funding rounds of companies right now. Uh, so in case you're planning uh, to start something in the area, uh, better get started soon, right? Because uh, over the next year or so, it will be difficult to get funding. Okay, uh, so that was my part. Uh, but now I would like to hand over to the young people in the group. So Morgan uh, will talk about language models and drug design. So that's this PhD student uh, project with Soza Parents. Everyone hear me okay? Cool. Okay, yeah, so uh, I'd just like to quickly talk about some of my research in Andreas's group. Uh, I also work in collaboration with industry. So a company called Soza Heptaris, they focus on uh, GPCR-based drug design, mostly using structure-based techniques. So what I mean by that is really incorporating protein uh, structure rather than ligand structure. So uh, in the next 15 minutes, I guess, I'll try and just go through a little introduction about the genetic models I use, how they fit into drug design, um, uh, which is uh, language-based models that I use. And then I'll talk about uh, maybe uh, some aspects that can draw parallels with machine learning. Um, I'm a chemist by training, so it might be a little bit chemistry heavy, but hopefully there are some parallels that uh, translate. So where does uh, generative models fit within drug design? Well, traditionally, the drug design uh, process, and what I mean by drug design is the actual design of the small molecule ligand that you're looking to, to design as a therapeutic, uh, is designed through the design, make, test, analyze cycles. This is an iterative cycle. It's very slow. It's very expensive. I'm sure you're all familiar. Um, and typically per molecule, it can take months per cycle. So if you're generating hundreds to maybe a thousand molecules per project, you're generally looking at maybe a year or two, best case a year traditionally. So with generative modeling, you want to try and augment uh, the design stage in silico. So you have a generative model uh, that basically iterates in silico, uh, the evaluation of these molecules, and then somehow you can optimize the generative model. And then obviously that's a lot faster, that's seconds per cycle, hopefully. Uh, even less. Uh, and if we remember Andreas's presentation yesterday, um, when we were looking at uh, where we can save uh, the most money during the overall drug discovery process, it was actually compound quality that makes the biggest difference. So although this is a lot faster, we need to remember that actually it's the quality of molecules that really makes a difference. Um, and there's a lot of hype around generative models uh, in drug design. So for example, this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago now from a, a startup company using AI. Uh, and they claimed to basically design this DDR1 kinase inhibitor in something like uh, 21 days, which was obviously very high impact in the field. Uh, that's almost unheard of. Um, but actually, this is quite controversial for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, because the chemistry wasn't that novel from uh, already existing kinase inhibitors. So actually, when you compare it to what a chemist would do, it, it might not even be published, let alone in a high impact journal like this. Uh, and then actually, if you dig into the supplementary information, uh, you find that actually there's still human selection processes. Uh, so it's still not fully autonomous AI driven selection. There's still humans that uh, filter the last 100 compounds and say, actually, I like this one and this one, and we'll make these and prospectively validate these. So it's not a true prospective validation of some of these AI systems. So anyway, in my work, uh, I use natural language processing, so more specifically recurrent neural networks, uh, either GRUs or LSTMs. Uh, empirically, I see very similar performance. And the way we can use natural language processing is because you can represent a uh, molecule's graph uh, as a language. So what you can see here is uh, what's called the smiles for paracetamol. So that's effectively uh, one way of encoding this graph information into a string. Uh, 
And then using that language representation, we can just simply train a recurrent neural network um, to basically uh, auto-aggressively learn which token comes next in the sequence based on conditional probability. Uh, this was designed for a chemistry audience. This is probably a more technical audience, uh, but effectively what we're doing is we're just maximizing the likelihood assigned to the correct token at each uh, time step. And then by propagating these hidden states um, uh, through the time steps, we're able to learn this conditional probability distribution uh, for each token throughout the sequence. So then when it comes to inference, we simply just put in our, our start token. So that could be a go in the smile string. And we just uh, iteratively sample the predicted probability distribution. Uh, and actually this works really well. So in, in this case, it, it perfectly uh, resamples paracetamol. It, it usually wouldn't do that. You usually end up with almost 100% novel molecules uh, and almost 100% validity in terms of the smile strings. Uh, and that's also something that's quite important to note is these smile strings uh, don't always translate to sensible molecules. So you can have a nonsense smell string due to the syntax uh, of this language. Uh, so yeah, you're just sampling from that probability distribution. Uh, if you're interested, there are other languages uh, that you can use, not just smiles. There are syntax variants uh, such as deep smiles, and there's also a relatively new language called selfies, uh, which basically guarantees 100% validity of your uh, string although there are caveats to this and you tend to get a less smooth traversal through chemical space, shall we say, uh, due to some of the intrinsic properties of the language. So once we've trained in RNN, uh, that's not the most interesting thing, really. We can uh, sample a distribution very similar to our training data set, but actually we wanna optimize that towards some objective. So you can do that with a couple of ways. Uh, most common ways are either fine tuning or otherwise known as transfer learning where you train uh, uh, or pre-train an RNN on a large data set. So there are these data sets such as Kemble with bioactive molecules in the order of millions. Uh, and then once you have this pre-trained RNN, you can effectively fine tune it on a much smaller data set. So this could be project relevant data. Uh, this could be sometimes even 10, 20 molecules. Uh, and what you get is obviously valid and error smiles that are then similar to your project data, somewhat novel, not always necessarily very novel. But then the caveat being, you require that project data in the first instance. And a lot of context in drug design, you don't have that project data. So uh, we have our other framework, which is reinforcement learning or other optimization algorithms that you can use. Again, you pre-train a recurrent neural network, except this time, uh, once it's pre-trained, you can then sample molecules uh, and then evaluate them according to some scoring functions which kind of define your objective function. And then you update your recurrent neural network based on the fitness of those molecules. Uh, again, depending on what scoring functions you use, you still have that data requirement if you use ML models. Um, but then you also have some caveats to this approach that if you use ML models for your scoring functions, and this is just simple uh, property predictions like a prediction of binding affinity, then what you get is exploitation of that ML model from the generative model, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later. But also in practice, you almost always need to use multi-parameter optimization. You can't just optimize one model. Uh, you have to offset exploitation of a particular model with either other models or other heuristics. Uh, and although RNNs are, I guess, uh, quite an old architecture now, uh, they're still very powerful in this domain. So if we look at some of the benchmarks, uh, they, they always come first or second. And actually there was a very recent benchmark a couple of, a couple of weeks ago uh, that compared them to much more recent architectures, much more complex ar ar architectures with many more parameters, uh, and they still generally outperform. So let's uh, just talk a little bit about data preprocessing. So uh, in this work, what I used was a benchmark data set that's, that's common within the field, it's called MOSIS. Uh, but actually, if you look at the preprocessing pre -processing steps within the benchmark, they always remove charged molecules. So an example here is a molecule that would be removed due to this uh, charged tertiary amine, where you can see the positive sign. And the justification they had in the paper was that charge groups were present in both forms within the data set. So you'd have the equivalent molecule with that tertiary amine um, not protonated effectively. But in reality, if you dig into the data, there's actually, uh, this actually means that they removed 35% of the data. And actually it was only 0.7% of that 35% that were present in both forms in the data set in terms of a functional group like this tertiary amine that was present in both the neutral and charged form in the data set. Uh, 
And this is a problem because you need to align your data set with your question. So actually the question I was trying to ask in this case is generating molecules that bind to DRD2. And a prerequisite for this is a cationic interaction with the residue in the binding pocket. So this is a problem. Uh, and the, the point I really wanna make here is that this benchmark isn't applicable to this question, which also I think translates to a lot of ML problems where you might take a classical benchmark uh, and just naively use it for a particular problem, but you always need to check that the benchmark you use is aligned to the question that you're asking, which I think harks back to some of the points that Andreas was making yesterday. You can use data augmentation in these generative models, uh, particularly using these smile strings. So actually, there's many ways that you can generate a smile string. You can randomize them, uh, and this proves better performance, um, as shown by a, a very popular publication. Uh, you get generally a greater coverage of de novo molecules, et cetera, et cetera. But there are still biases in the RNN. So actually, even if you augment this data, uh, I found out very recently that they can still be incredibly sensitive to the order of the smiles uh, that, that you give it. So just it's always important to double check. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't have that data in. Uh, as well as debiasing the training data set is really important. And actually, this is something I haven't seen done in the literature. But of course, with uh, chemical, chemical data sets, you get a, a very uneven distribution. So some areas in chemical space are represented much more than others where you have project uh, series that really focus on a, a narrow area of chemical space. But actually, if you try and debias this and even out the distribution, you get much more interesting molecules, much more diverse molecules. And actually this has a large impact on the kind of uh, generated data that you get from these de novo molecules. So if I now move on just quickly to optimizing different objective functions, this is quite a popular paper a couple of years ago that kind of points towards how a generative model can exploit an ML model used as a scoring function. So what I mean by that was they looked at several different um, generative models uh, on the y-axis here for several different case studies across the x-axis. And in this case, they're just using a traditional random forest uh, ML model, uh, which is actually used an awful lot in industry. Um, and what they do is they optimize against one particular trained random forest model in the blue line. So that's what the generative models are trying to maximize. But if you take the exact same model and you train it in the exact same way with a slightly different random seed, you can see this huge gap between the predicted probability of those nova molecules. So actually it's already optimizing towards the very specific parameters of that random forest. And if you train it with a different data split, then you see an even larger gap, although that's somewhat more intuitive uh, expected. So what I've done, uh, this is still early work with the master's student, is effectively systematically assess different molecular representations or featureizations and different machine learning models to see what kind of difference we get in uh, generated molecules. And what you can see here just very briefly is the significance of different metrics, uh, by no means uh, read them all, uh, but effectively the, the dotted line is this uh, significance level. And you can see that, especially which QSAR algorithm you use, so which ML algorithm you use, you get really significant differences um, between the genera generated molecules. Uh, and just as an example here, uh, looking at uniqueness, which is a metric for the molecules generated, you can see if you use a random forest compared to logistic regression, uh, you get much worse model performance. So actually choosing which molecular representation to use and which ML model to use isn't really trivial. So then I also moved on to look at the difference between optimizing against uh, an ML model, in this case, a support vector machine trained on active molecules against dopamine receptor uh, D2 compared to a non-ML model. Uh, and what I mean here is a physics-based principled model that uses docking. So effectively just complementarity of a ligand to the protein. Uh, with absolutely no kind of you know explicit ligand data incorporated into that scoring function and see what the differences are in uh, de novo molecules when we optimize against these two different scoring functions uh, and i thought the results were quite interesting so effectively what you see is uh, the generative model maintains uh, better properties throughout training so you can see the uniqueness is much higher you maintain much higher diversity in the molecules that you generate you're much more faithful to your training data set, which uh, can be good or bad, depending on context. But what I found most interesting uh, was that you actually get a far greater coverage 
of de novo molecules to known active chemical space. Uh, and that's to the same active chemical space that was used to explicitly train the ML model. So actually using complementarity to this protein, uh, you get much more reasonable molecules that, than uh, optimizing towards the predictivity by this uh, ML model. Uh, and this is uh, just a caveat to say that uh, optimizing docking score alone isn't really uh, a good scoring function and you need to add more heuristics, but I'll skip over that. Okay, so docking is great. Um, it, it looks quite promising in terms of being used for a scoring function. But the problem with reinforcement learning is it's slow and it's really sample inefficient. And I think this is a paradigm more generally for reinforcement learning. So it takes over 100,000 molecules to be able to optimize this objective. And that means uh, it's, it's fine for something very quick to compute, like um, ML inference, but uh, it's not good for something like docking that takes 10 to 30 seconds per molecule. So you need uh, a lot of compute resource, which, uh, which isn't very good. So how can we improve that? So if I just uh, dig very quickly into um, the algorithm that I was specifically using for reinforcement learning, what happens is you pre-train this prior. Uh, I'm not sure if I can point here. Yeah. So this is the pre-trained prior. You then effectively take an exact copy of that prior with the same parameters for your agent. And then each step, you sample a batch of molecules that you evaluate with your scoring function and you assign a reward to each. Then what you do is you compute what's called the augmented log likelihood. So you can think of this as a combination of your prior policy, which is used as a regularizer to make sure that you maintain similar chemistry to your prior, a scale uh, and a combination of the reward for each molecule, sorry, scaled by the scaling coefficient sigma. You then compute the loss, which is actually more like a distance between this uh, target policy that you're defining, the augmented log likelihood, uh, versus the agent policy. And of course, it's a mini batch, so you average over the mini batch. So in theory, if you change sigma, you increase the contribution that your reward has to your loss function, and you would think, yes, I can just optimize my scoring function quicker. Uh, but that's actually not necessarily the case. Uh, as you can see here, changing sigma has a very small effect over a short time scale. But if you think about it in a little bit more detail, uh, in a particular scenario where you've got very sparse rewards, so you're early in the learning process where you're trying to learn a very complex objective, then your reward contribution uh, trends towards zero and your target policy just comes back to your prior policy. So actually you're really heavily regularizing uh, your loss. So just as a, a first port of call to try and avoid this, we use important sampling and only focus on the molecules, uh, the, the top 50% of the molecules in the batch with the highest rewards, which is also referred to as hill climbing. Uh, hence we call this uh, augmented hill climb. And we can see now that actually optimization power and efficiency in terms of the number of samples you require to optimize this uh, scoring function is, is much better. It's much more efficient. Um, so uh, something else to keep in mind is that uh, it's really important that you remember what your chemistry looks like, which is often overlooked in a lot of techni technology driven publications. So a lot of publications from computer science kind of uh, overlook the kind of chemistry that's generated, which is super important. So you can see here that as you change sigma, uh, the, the areas in gray uh, in these uh, spaces are basically property space that isn't present in your original pre-training data set. So actually you can think of it as kind of generalizing into a property space that wasn't present initially. So you kind of want to avoid that usually because it means that you're uh, perhaps exploiting your scoring function or just generally not staying proof, uh, faithful to your prior distribution. Uh, but as you can see, augmented hill climb uh, for the right values of sigma maintains this uh, property. Uh, and I'm running short on time a little bit, so uh, skip ahead, but effectively this approach is much more efficient for several different data sets. So optimizing docking against several different GPCR targets. Um, and overall uh, across several baselines, it's on average, uh, something like 40 fold more efficient in terms of the number of samples that you require. And I just want to stress that it's always really important to check the chemistry uh, if you ever uh, decide to move into generative models for de novo molecular design. Uh, and I'll skip over a little bit of this, but the take home is that the chemistry remains as reasonable as the original algorithm reinvent, uh, which has already been proven to be very reasonable with many publications. Uh, 
So in effect, what you can see here is we're benchmarking this augmented hill climb approach, which is the purple line uh, compared to a lot of other common reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, and effectively across several easy, medium and hard tasks, you can see it, it generally outperforms. Uh, and this is my last slide before I move over to Benoit, but what I'm doing now is I'm checking this algorithm uh, also works for larger language models, so transformers. Uh, this is actually somewhat more tricky. Um, I've seen fewer publications that use transformers in a reinforcement learning paradigm. Uh, and actually these larger language models can be uh, very unstable under reinforcement learning conditions, which is kind of an interesting observation. Uh, and if anyone has any experience with using transformers for reinforcement learning, uh, I'd be very interested to, to have a conversation. But so far, uh, when it does work, augmented tail climb uh, still outperforms the original implementation. So I'll move over to Benoit now, but uh, hopefully that was just a, an overview of uh, some of the, my research and generation models. Thanks, Marvin. And thank you, Andreas, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So we'll be discussing my latest research about selecting bioactive like conformations of small molecules using atomistic neural networks. Uh, so I will give a brief introduction and give a bit of context. Uh, I will go through the methods, uh, the model data sets, uh, a bit how you will evaluate the model, and then giving a brief uh, overview of the results. So the context here is to find bioactive conformations, uh, which is important in virtual screening. So you want to find actives among a, a lot of decoys in huge libraries and only focus on the actives. And for that, you need to take into account the 3D structure of the molecule. And for, to reach this objective, you can use docking or pharmacophore searching, which require always a 3D structure. So imagine you have a molecule here. Uh, you can use traditional conformal generator to try and find plausible uh, 3D conformations. Uh, but the thing is that you don't know which one may be bioactive. And in practice, uh, there's a bioactive-like conformations among these ensemble of potential, conform potential conformers. Uh, but only 70% are retrieved in the top 10, and 40% are retrieved uh, taking only the top one, because you may have a different ordering of the conformers. So you need to find kind of um, a better way to select the conformation. So let's say you have this molecule, you can generate different conformations for this molecule, but does any of you have any idea which one is bioactive? Let's say I want, this is a potential drug for JEK2 protein. There's no way to, to know which one is bioactive. So in, if you have, for example, the actual label, so this is the bioactive conformation, then you can compute the deviation and say that the one at the bottom is close to the bioactive conformation. And in that case, uh, what uh, I want to reach is to have some kind of model that says, this is the conformation that you should test and try to see if um, this molecule might be active or not towards the protein target of interest. So for that, I'm using the Schnetz atomistic neural network. So um, as inputs, I have this conformation, uh, which can be represented as a set of atomic positions and atomic numbers. Uh, but the thing is that if you work in 3D, uh, these points um, are just atomic positions. And depending on whether you translate or rotate the molecule, it's kind of difficult to model that uh, directly using the XYZ positions in the neural network. So what is done first is a kind of row embedding, trying to encode the interatomic distances and just to have the information of which atom is actually present uh, and what is the, um, the two atoms. Um, that are playing in the, in the distance. Then there will be a few interaction blocks, which um, is kind of similar to what we can do with uh, convolutional neural networks or graph neural networks. And it's trying to incorporate the, the information about the neighborhood of at a certain atom position. So for example, for this uh, atom here, it's incorporating the information from the oxygen, the nitrogen, this carbon. Um, and depending on whether the atoms are close or not, the, the message coming from this atom will be more or less important. So it's very similar to message passing, but more like in 3D and based on the distance. And in the end, we obtain a single value for each atom, a processed atom embedding through a series of six interaction blocks. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is to obtain a single value for the conformation um, and to have some kind of permutation invariant aggregation, I'm using the sum 
So this model I described is Schnett, but there are, there are some newer models that also incorporate the angles between the atoms, uh, the torsion angles with, um, so there's dime nets, sphere nets, etc. cetera. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is using Schnett to obtain a single value. And I train the model so that this single value is the deviation to the closest known bioactive conformation. And just using a, using a single loss function, which is the root mean square error. Uh, so I have the model, and now I think I need to speak about uh, a little bit about the data. Uh, I'm using the PDB bind data set. So it's a subset of the PDB. So it's where all the data about ligand bound to proteins uh, from crystallography uh, to determine what is the 3D structure is stored. So it's a subset uh, with uh, uh, 14,000 ligands. Uh, 17,000 complexes. Uh, so first step always when you have data is to try to apply some pre-processing and standardization. Uh, often we tend to trust directly the data that is provided to us, but it's not always the case that the data uh, is clean. So always do this kind of uh, pre-processing steps. So what I have here is all the bioactive conformations for um, 12,000 ligands. Uh, but what I'd like to have is a set of generated conformers for each of those ligands. And for each of them, I compute the deviation for the ARMSD. Uh, so in the end, I have roughly 1 million conformations. And for each of these conformations, I have a single value label. And I'm using the, the model I presented just earlier to train the model and have that. Uh, and to test also the applicability domain of the model, so on which kind of uh, chemical structure is it efficient. Uh, so I have this standard 80%, 10%, 10% uh, train validation and test uh, splits. Validation is used to stop the training once the validation loss has stopped decreasing, so it's an early stopping strategy. And then we have three different kinds of splits. So the random splits is just randomly distributing the molecules between the train and uh, validation and test set just so we have different molecules between the different sets. There's also the scaffold split. So the scaffold is um, just a, a structure with the different rings. Uh, it's a kind of substructure trying to, to class the atom in uh, different groups, different categories. Uh, so we'll have different scaffolds between the train and test sets. And also there's the protein splits uh, where I try to obtain uh, between the training and test set uh, molecules that will bind to different proteins. So uh, let's say I want to try and see if this molecule binds to this uh, protein. So I will use rigid ligand docking for this, but starting from the molecule, I will have uh, to generate conformations, 3D uh, structures, and I want only to keep a subset of the structure. So what I will do first is to use the model to predict the deviation to the closest known bioactive conformation. Then I will rank each of these conformations and only keeping the one that have a low, um, the lowest uh, predicted uh, deviation to bioactive. And once I have only this subset, uh, I will use uh, a docking algorithm, which is gold, um, and making sure that I will keep the um, the conformation uh, rigid uh, so that it's not changing and I will stick to this um, refined set of conformation. To evaluate the model, I will use different metrics. So for the prediction, uh, what we usually, usually in regression is the RMSC metric or the R squared. Then uh, for the selection of conformations, so this is only predicted values uh, and it's to be honest, uh, not always uh, precise. So it's important to check in these subsets. So let's say we take the 10, first 10% of the list, if it's enriched in bioactive light conformations. And for the rigid ligand docking, so I'm using the dirty virtual screening set, uh, which is composed of active molecules who are the certain targets. And for each active molecule, there are 50 decoys. So molecules that resemble the active molecules, but that are not active. Uh, <clears throat> and for each fraction, so fractions ranging from zero, I mean 1% to 100%. Uh, so I will dock the, the molecules and we dock each conformation um, and take only the molecules, uh, take the molecules that have the highest score. So for 
there are two dimensions here. So there's the molecule dimension. So we test a lot of molecules. And for each of these molecules, we will test a lot of conformations. So either testing 1%, 10%, or 100%, let's say. Uh, and here I'm um, assessing the enrichment of, uh, active, uh, of active molecules using the bedrock metric. So it's close to the enrichment factor at 8%. Um, and for the baseline, so it's maybe not useful for, um, for everyone to know the baselines, uh, but just uh, for the conformation ranking, uh, there's just randomly shuffling the conformations. Uh, there's the ascending uh, force field energy because in sometimes in practice, low energy conformers tend to bind more to proteins than higher energy conformations because they're still like the strain. So the ligand has to adapt to the pockets but it does not make a lot of change so that the energy of the ligand is too high. It's trying to, to reach some kind of uh, optimized uh, conformation. And then there's also the conformer generator order, uh, which is uh, using a combination of the energy and the probability of finding specific torsion pattern uh, in ligands in uh, another database, which is the, the, crystal, the Cambridge crystallographic uh, structure database. So if you just check the results of the regression alone, so if, is the model good at finding the right deviation? Uh, I would say compared to the mouse size model, which is the baseline, uh, it's not outperforming that well. So it's great on the random speed, so testing on different molecules, uh, testing on different scaffolds, but when testing on uh, ligands that binds different protein, uh, it's not working fine. So here's the RMSC, so lower is better. Here is the R2. So uh, higher is better, as squared, sorry. Uh, but I think what's important is the ability of the model to rank conformations. Uh, so when you check what's the enrichment factor of bioactive like conformations uh, at different fraction of selected uh, ranked conformations. So here, each line is a ranker. So you have the three baselines, which are here have low uh, enrichment factor, even at uh, early fractions. For random EFF energy and uh, CCDG. Uh, and then the, the other lines represent the models. So here in red, the random splits model, scaffold splits, and protein splits. Uh, so here at early fraction, so selecting, let's say, only 10% of the conformations here, you have an enrichment factor of uh, two, which means that you have twice the chance of finding a bioactive like conformations uh, using the top ranked list uh, of conformations as ranked by the model. Uh, however, like most of the uh, models uh, in chemistry, there's always a correlation between the performance of models and how similar is the test molecule compared to what you are seeing in training. So for example, here um, on the x-axis is the maximum similarity to the training set. So here you are, uh, it's situations where you have a very, we have very similar molecules in the training set. Meanwhile, here it's testing on uh, new molecules totally different from what you are seeing in the, in the training set. And as you can see, it's easier to have a high enrichment factor of bioactive like conformations for molecules that are close to the training set, uh, as opposed to the molecules that are, don't have any analogs uh, in the training set. And, uh, but still this ability of ranking conformations uh, can be useful for virtual screening. So this is uh, the dirty uh, virtual screening for the JAT2 uh, protein target. So you, want to, you have a list of molecules and you want to retrieve which one are active among this list of molecules. You can test 100% of the conformations, which takes a long time. Uh, but here, what I want to propose is to use only a restricted set of conformation as ranked by the model. So if you take uh, a low fraction of rank conformation, let's say 5%, and if you check for each ranker, um, how many actives you retrieve. So for the baselines here, uh, it's only as you increase the number of conformations that you test that you will find the active. Uh, meanwhile, using the model, you directly find uh, conformations that correspond to the active conformation. Therefore, they have higher scores in docking. And then you find um, the same amount of active compound as if you are using the 100%, but using only like 5%, which represents between 10 to 100 uh, fold speed up, which is time that can be uh, used in virtual screening. Uh, 
So yeah, just giving a brief summary that the, um, these atomistic neural networks, so SHNETs, can be used to predict the deviation to bioactive conformation. Uh, and this can be used as a score to rank the conformations and only select 3D conformations that should be tested in virtual screening. However, the main limitation is the limited applicability domain when you try to test the model on ligands uh, of uh, different uh, proteins uh, or molecules that are too dissimilar from the training set. Yeah, and I guess that uh, sums up the presentation. So if you want to say a last thing, Andres, maybe, or maybe we can conclude uh, with that. Uh, it depends on the task. Uh, so I think um, in most of the simple tasks like mo in molecular property prediction, the 2D descriptors are working fine and there's not a lot of added value in adding the 3D information. But I think here, like for bioactivity, since you're dealing with proteins that are 3D entities, uh, we usually rely on 3D information, but the, the field of using deep learning on 3D is only starting. So uh, since the, like the last four years and it's adding uh, some uh, great performance recently on that, yeah. So for what these dogs, right? You think about how you interact with proteins and uh, one is about generating them, one is about ranking them. Uh, do we also consider descriptors of proteins? Like these are foundational things, so why not also encode uh, proteins that we target? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think uh, that's a perspective also on my, of my work is trying to incorporate uh, protein information. Uh, but it's sometimes not simple. So there are some proteochemometric models that use ligand descriptors and protein descriptors and to make some kind of prediction of the binding affinity. Uh, I guess most of the protein descriptors were 2D in a sense, so considering the sequence of amino acids or just considering the pockets. Um, I think it's shifting now towards more like 3D descriptors of protein as well, which uh, can give a kind of context. Your, uh, <laughs> the confirmation depends on the protein, right? Mm -hmm. So it could condition, for example, on that, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.